and welcome to our first AOS India webinar week. Uh, we are pleased to invite you at free live webinars which will be delivered by Microsoft community leaders and MVPs. Uh, this is a webinar week where you will connect community leaders throughout this week every day at 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. as per the Indian Standard Time. And uh, today's topic is uh, running SharePoint 2016 in Azure. The do's and the don'ts by Jasjit Chopra from Chandigarh who is a principal architect and founder at Pandera Technologies. Uh, if you have any type of questions and answer, you can type in the chat box. And yes, you will get a prize from Microsoft uh, to the participants who will provide a right answer, uh, which will be asked by presenter at the end of the session. And yes, a recorded version uh, of this webinar will be published in YouTube channel. So for uh, for your uh, further reference, and also you can tweet about us on Twitter by specifying the hash AOS India. So uh, before I take much of our presenter time i will i, I will make uh, joshi the present, uh, presenter to start today's session so uh, joshi i would request you to uh, start the session of today's topic sure thank you diti can you hear me uh, yes perfect all right yeah. hi everyone uh, my name is joshi chopra let's go ahead and uh, start presenting now yet but yeah, it's, it's a fabulous place to spend time. I, I really hope everyone should uh, get uh, one opportunity in their lifetime to go ahead and visit this place. All right, let's, let's get started on our topic here. Uh, we're going to talk about SharePoint 2016 on Azure. And I'll just talk about a little bit of background on my end. I have been a SharePoint architect for a long time. And I'm um, basically pivoting my uh, career on the Azure consulting as well at this point. So this makes perfect sense where uh, we're, uh, you know, uh, we're having a marriage of both uh, SharePoint and Azure uh, together, and, and for me, this is very interesting. Um, so, um, first, uh, first of all, um, yeah, this this might sound a little bit weird, but uh, why do you want to do this? And and I suggest you first first uh, advice is to don't do it seriously. I mean, um, I'll I'll take an analogy here, right? Um, so when you when you're when you're riding uh, when you learn to ride your uh, motorcycle for the first time, oh, what do you do? And I'll take an example here since we have a lot of Indian uh, context here, uh, Indian uh, attendees here. You probably drive uh, a maximum 100 or 150 cc motorcycle, right? It's pretty much got the same components to it. It's got your um, same. Uh, tires, engines, the way you accelerate, uh, your your clutch controls, your gear controls, and everything, right? And the way you start it and stop and you brake, you you know all those functions and how to make it work, and you know how to get from point A to point B. What happens if I give you a 12,000 cc Yamaha bike? What will happen at that point of time? And I did not give you the whole manual to go through it to understand how to ride that bike, right? You will have issues. You might be able to get to from point A to point B, that's not the point. The point is um, everything is different in Azure. Little, little things matter. So the very first advice is if you can do it in Office 365, do it there. Do not jump on uh, creating a SharePoint environment in IaaS. Now, again, uh, this topic is all about IaaS, uh, which is IaaS information, uh, sorry. Infrastructure as a in service in the cloud, that's what we're going to talk about. So this is about putting SharePoint on virtual machines in Azure. So uh, do it only as a last resort. Don't do it otherwise. All right. And, and we're going to look into uh, why we might want to do it in the first place. So let's let's see if you have to do it and why, 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 why would we pick this. So um, some of the common scenarios are written here on the slide. We're going to go from it. So if you have a fresh start where your either a startup or you're uh, working for a company which doesn't have its own data center, right? Or you are uh, going to retire your existing hardware or your data center. Maybe the lease on the building that you have your servers in is going to expire. So there are n number of reasons on that part. So yes, in that case, on a temporary situation, you would want to go and, and take your shape on farms, virtual machines that are there already on premise and move them as is in Azure. And then, Try again on a long-term basis, move your uh, uh, main workload to Office 365 rather than being dependent on uh, IAS uh, for SharePoint workload, right? 
But of course, there are certain scenarios where you need server-side custom development. So in that case, I would say reduce the footprint, use only the SharePoint environment for that workload. The rest should again be migrated to Office 365. You want to evaluate this product. You want to see how it works. You want to see the on-prem functioning of this, right? You can go ahead and do that. And um, you know, in in certain cases, uh, now there is an asterisk to that for elasticity. It's it's a very it's it's a the, the reason I have a, an asterisk there is because there is a caveat over there, right? So we we've heard cloud is easily scalable, right? That's what that elasticity means, pretty much. But what exactly does that mean? So in, in, in SharePoint environment or in a SharePoint workload or scenarios for businesses, I've come across very few cases where you need rapid scalability. Rapid scalability means that one week you're running on 10 servers and the next week you're running on uh, four servers, right? That kind of elasticity is not required as such when it comes to uh, the cloud. But yes, the advantages are there. Today, you start with a workload where you only have two SharePoint servers and maybe you really, really grow so fast and you use and you depend on SharePoint too much, you want to go to 10 servers. In cloud, it is not an issue. But again, the automation part uh, for uh, scalability does not apply in terms of SharePoint. So the, the availability scale sets and auto scaling options that you find in virtual machines, especially in the Azure web services, are not applicable here. You have to manually automate that process somehow. That, OK, today we have two web front ends. We want two more because we have more load. You will have to decide on your own how to uh, grow there. Today, let's say you have a lot of um, processor usage in your indexing or your search uh, service application environment in your, ser in, in your SharePoint form. You will have to manually or probably script it somehow on your own. But the point is that responsibility lies on your end. So uh, talking about responsibility, uh, 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 infrastructure as, an, uh, uh, as, an, as a service is basically all about that. What all is responsible for uh, uh, um, the customer to manage on its own? And what is Microsoft uh, uh, responsible for uh, as an Azure service provider, right? The cloud service provider. So keep, keep those distinguished uh, in, in, in mind, even though you are moving away from taking care of physical hardware issues, you still have to manage your virtual machine uh, in, in a lot of different ways that, that Microsoft will not do that, All right? Now, there are other scenarios for which you could use this uh, Azure in the cloud, uh, SharePoint 2016 in the cloud, or SharePoint in general. This, the, the principles and um, uh, the, the topics and the issues that we're going to talk about, uh, the configuration options and other things that we're going to talk about are applicable not only to SharePoint 2016, but mostly to 2010 and 2013 as well. But again, if, if you're going to cloud, um, I would suggest go with the latest version and not fall back on the others, right? And the depth test scenario is perfect in this case. It makes more sense to create your um, dev virtual machines in the cloud. And I don't know if you've seen all the uh, automation services from Azure as well. You can power on a virtual machine on a timely basis, and there is an auto shutdown feature as well. So it will not only automatically shut down your virtual machine, but it will automatically stop your billing as well. So let's say you have a developer, you have a team of 10 developers, and they work from 9 AM to 5 PM. So you can actually go ahead and automate that your developers' virtual machines, they start at 8 a.m. in the morning, and they end at 6 p.m., right? And you should be able to, again, there's something called RBAC, which is role-based access control. You can give uh, the power to the developer so that he can log into your Azure portal and have the permission to start or stop that virtual machine. So in case he wants to work uh, after hours or on weekends when the virtual machine is in a shutdown state, he should be able to go to the portal, switch it on, take two minutes uh, to, to warm it up, uh, depending on what kind of uh, um, uh, storage and, and processing power you've assigned to that virtual machine. It might take anywhere between two to three minutes. Uh, the virtual machine comes up, and he can start working on it. 
So that those are the perfect uh, scenario. Uh, Devon test is a very best suited workload for running uh, uh, SharePoint in the cloud uh, as a in infrastructure as a service uh, component, right? Then comes uh, pilot and proof of concepts, right? A lot of organizations are contemplating on, hey, um, I have an option of X, Y, Z uh, 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 vendors in the market. SharePoint happens to be one of them. What do I do, right? And in that scenario, uh, you can uh, uh, just to deploy a proof of concept and to see how it works. There are already uh, images available with SharePoint that are installed on it. Again, SharePoint is installed on the image. It is not configured, right? So you can quickly go ahead and just start the configuration and start working on uh, SharePoint platform using those uh, pre-created uh, images that are available from Microsoft. And they are uh, available in uh, a license, 30-day license period as well, and, and go from there. Of course, you can use it for production. And I highly recommend you don't do that unless you cannot meet your demands using Office 365. Now, this is another interesting scenario that I've actually deployed for, uh, uh, for my clients, which is a disaster recovery. So in, in, in some cases, you do have your uh, SharePoint environment on-prem, and you only have one data center. You don't have multiple data centers. So what do you do in that case? You take your uh, SharePoint uh, backups in a way where you can have uh, three layers of disaster recovery, three, three types of disaster recovery, which is uh, cold, warm, and hot, right? So all of these standby options can be configured in, 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 in the cloud. The third is hybrid. Now, I don't mean hybrid as in, uh, 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 I, I, I mean hybrid where you do have a, an Office 365 tenant as well and you integrate that with your uh, um, IAS instance of SharePoint, whether it's on your own data center or somebody else's rented data center or Azure in this case, right? So in that scenario also, you can run uh, um, SharePoint on uh, Azure Cloud. Now, um, there are, so, so the next slides are going to cover all of this in, in, in detail. I'm um, just going to cover these topics and tell you that we're going to cover, uh, so let's say we do want to go ahead and, and, and deploy our SharePoint environment in Azure. Uh, what will be the, uh, we have to think about all of these uh, uh, points before we go ahead. And this is what makes driving that motorcycle that we said is completely different, uh, different in Azure, right? So these are the points that you would think about on your own data center in a completely different way. Right? Identity is one of them. Resource groups, you have to understand that everything in Azure is Azure belongs to resource group. And you can do a billing in a lot of different ways to all of the resources that are um, there in, in, in Azure as well. And then there are connectivity options. Then there are uh, virtual machine sizes. Then how do we define storage and how do we attach and detach storage and we take backup and restore, right? How do we work with those options in Azure? Uh, 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 while we're working with uh, uh, SharePoint specifically. And then, of course, there is security. And security basically ties back to the first point, in, uh, which is identity. So let's, let's cover them. Now, uh, resource groups are uh, very interesting. And um, what you can do is, so if you're creating a POC, for example, I would create a resource group called POC Project 1 and put all my Azure resources in there. And the moment I'm done with that POC, I'll go ahead and delete that. So that's one of the second options right there on the slide, which is a life cycle. So I know I have an expiry to all the resources that I'm going to create. So I will create everything in that resource group accordingly and get rid of it once uh, the project ends, right, or, or that end. And, and, and these two are uh, kind of intertwingled uh, with each other. Uh, so let's say I deploy a workload uh, in Azure that is dependent on a life cycle. I know the life cycle of this particular uh, 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 resource is going to be two years. So I club everything in that particular resource group. And once the, that life cycle uh, finishes, uh, I can go ahead and remove that resource group, and it will go ahead and delete everything associated with it. Why we are doing this? We really have to understand this. Why? The why is because resource groups are logical grouping of all your resources. And one benefit of having this is to get rid of it when you do it. The other benefit is to also have uh, the billing uh, bifurcation. You will understand exactly 
uh, how much that particular resource group is costing you every month, every day, right? And of course, it's 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 uh, billing is a completely uh, altogether different topic. We can talk about it uh, for a whole day in Azure, but remember, there are other options as well. So every single resource that you deploy in Azure has a tag element to it. So you can do billing by tags as well and, and aggregate those functions. All right. So let's go ahead and move on to our next slide. Now this is this is where it gets very interesting. Now if your SharePoint site, SharePoint servers are living in the cloud, how do you get the connectivity? Of course, Microsoft recommends Express Route, but it is very, very expensive. Not every small or medium business enterprise can do it. And um, it's not necessary that it will uh, it will be the the first choice for uh, even uh, medium to large enterprises, right? So uh, you have to understand uh, how this uh, Express Route works. Basically, Microsoft takes a you you get a private tunnel to Microsoft Network, and it is off. Uh, it is not communicating anywhere with the internet. So you get a personal dedicated pipeline, and it has a certain amount of SLA of uptime and uh, kind of bandwidth uh, allocation to you. Now, um, the other part that you have to be very uh, careful about is uh, data costs. Anything that goes inside of Azure is free of cost. Anything that comes out is going to cost you. So even if you have connected um, using a VPN tunnel uh, over the internet, uh, whatever you're uh, going ahead, or whatever you're doing with uh, uh, getting data out of it, whatever data is coming out of the Azure Data Center region that you're talking to, is going to be <coughs> charged as well. So even though that charge is very, very minimal, I have to tell you that be be ready about it because if you're doing your uh, backups on it, for example, uh, and, and and taking that data to your on-prem environment for some reason then this is going to be an issue because every day uh, if, if gigabytes of uh, data or terabytes of data are going to uh, travel across that tunnel, it's, 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 it's going to get expensive real soon, right? And um, I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but we, we've had this challenge with uh, SharePoint where uh, SharePoint is not very easily deployable across uh, the whole geography. So geo deployments of SharePoints are very tough to do. It's not impossible. Microsoft has a technical article on it, how to do it. Uh, but for deploying SharePoint in Azure, just remember, uh, choose the. You have to choose the nearest data center where uh, Azure is providing its services and 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 uh, 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 basically host your virtual machines over there, because then you'll have the uh, the, the the latency will be really uh, less from from that particular location to your point. Now, if you have a global organization. Microsoft has something called edge networks. So figure out how to leverage that edge networking and, and, and pour out your uh, uh, Microsoft, uh, route your customers via that route to, to reduce that latency. So I'll just give you an example. If you host your um, virtual machine in East US, uh, where your SharePoint farm is running, all your virtual machines are in East US, and you have a good amount of customers in, in, in London, then London has an edge point uh, where Microsoft Network is there already. So if you take the route of going from London to uh, 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 East US where your uh, SharePoint is hosted, that latency over the internet will be very big. But if you route them through the edge network of uh, London, then the London to US, uh, East US connectivity within the Microsoft network will be much far less. So you are reducing that latency for your end user in a uh, uh, geo-dispersed uh, 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 audience, right? Now, be very careful about IP address spacing as well. So you need to involve your networking team uh, before you go ahead and design those and, and fill in those IP addresses of your virtual machines because you will be uh, putting on and, and connecting with virtual networks that might conflict with your IP address spacing on your own internal network that you're using, right? Um, static IPs, always, always use static IPs in, in Azure. Uh, they are actually static IPs in a way. They're not dynamic, even though they look dynamic. Uh, and, and be very careful about public IP addresses as well. They have a way of expiry, and, and they have a way of, you can, you can basically buy, uh, um, 
uh, public IPs from from ship uh, from Azure using CLI as well. So just uh, make sure you plan for that as well. And uh, the way static IPs work for virtual machines in um, Azure is also very different. Uh, so even though it, it, it looks like it's coming up via a, a, a DHCP server, but that lease time is forever. So that's how they mimic the static IP. But just be wary of it, how those IP addresses are assigned to your virtual machines, especially when you're doing disaster recovery or you're doing uh, site recovery um, uh, orchestration in that scenario, right? And then there is a load balancer component. How do you work on load balancing, right? So load balancer is very different in Azure. Azure does offer you uh, its own load balancing service. But again, it is not at par with um, F5. It has some limitations, but for most of your basic needs, it should suffice. So if you just want to do a load balancing between two web front end servers within your SharePoint farm, it will basically work. Now, there are advanced, like F5 does offer its own appliance in the cloud, so you can go ahead and rent those as well. But again, uh, uh, the cost will be different, and you'll have to manage that particular appliance on your own. Now, uh, the next topic is very interesting. and uh, it is also very important to, to give a uh, um, good amount of consideration to each and every point that I've mentioned here. Uh, um, so you, there, there are some design uh, 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 design limitations on VM sizes, right? So you have so in on-prem environments, what what happens in on-premises? You would pretty much go ahead and say, "Hey, I want two gigabytes of memory." With a four-core processor, great. You want a uh, two-gigabyte memory and you want eight-core processor, great. You can have that in the virtual machine because you have control over the hypervisor field, right? Not so much in 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 uh, the Azure cloud. You have predefined a virtual machine sizes there already, and uh, what Microsoft says is you have to use large memory sizes for your unpredicted uh, usage patterns. So if, for example, you have two web front-end servers, and you uh, know that the load is going to fluctuate from 20% to 100%, which is what the unpredicted usage pattern means over here, then uh, do not size your virtual machine for that 50% load. In fact, sizes for that 100% load uh, to have a smooth functioning. All right. Or if you can predict exactly when that 100% goes, or in 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 which weeks or days or months you you get that, you can uh, uh, reduce your web front end uh, memory footprint or change the size of the VM. That scalability is supported in 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 a way in this form right here. Uh, do not ever undersize uh, your virtual machines. That will give you a huge headache in, in, in understanding the performance bottlenecks that you will get, right? And then there are disk size limitations. Now, this, is, this has frustrated a lot of architects in the past, right? So what do I mean by disk size uh, uh, limitations? Right? There are disk count limitations as well, like how many disks you can apply and uh, what IOPS you will achieve from there. So when you pick a VM size, um, like an A1, A2, A4, F1, there, there's so many different uh, um, naming conventions that they've used for it. Um, so uh, when you pick them, they come with disk uh, 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 size limitation, count limitation, and IOPS limitations. Right. So um, if you pick a very small VM, it will not not allow you to add more than one or two disks, and then there will be a limitation on how much IOPS you can attain out of it, right? So when you're planning all of this, make sure you go back to the limitations of uh, 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 that virtual machine, uh, how many disks are allowed and how many disks are not allowed. So when you grow in future or um, you deploy this, you don't run into performance issues because of the IOPS limitations. And then, oh, I cannot have more IOPS because it's it's maxed out, right? So be very careful when you're designing these solutions on this. And again, there is a we we'll look at uh, future slides where I'll actually give you a baseline of where to start from if you want to build up very basic high availability uh, Azure, uh, sorry, SharePoint farm in Azure, right? Then there are availability sets. You have to have to have availability sets and, and define them properly. Now, what happens? I can go on and on uh, about this as well. 
a lot, but on a very basic, uh, there are uh, fault domains, um, right? So um, every piece of physical hardware will be different if you put two virtual machines on the same availability set. And Microsoft will make sure that uh, the physical machine where uh, the hypervisor is, the networking component, the power lines are completely separate for those two virtual machines. And then there is something called update domain. Update domain is also, uh, again, you just have to define the availability set. Microsoft automatically in the back end dynamically takes care of the update domain. Microsoft will never patch the physical hypervisor on the same time uh, um, as both your virtual machines at that point of time, right? So uh, if you want more details on this, uh, just uh, go ahead and look on the MSDN about this, but this is very important. And we do support uh, um, sysprepped uh, disk images as well. So you can actually install uh, SharePoint bits and SQL bits as well and, and do the automation if you're doing a disaster recovery scenario where you don't want to build anything from scratch and, and have the cost of it. You can, in theory, again, in theory, you can uh, uh, create complete uh, uh, SharePoint forms from scratch with automated way using uh, sysprep images as well. And there are uh, preloaded uh, virtual machines and images uh, that are, sorry, saying virtual machines. There are preloaded Azure uh, virtual machine images that are available. And you have to understand that there are, uh, 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 the way they work is, so in SharePoint you have cumulative patches. Right. So if today Microsoft release a new cumulative patch, that patch image will not be available in Azure. In Azure, if you look at the 2016 image, it will be the last, the minimum supported version. So if 2016 RTM came out and that RTM version is still supported today, that is the image that will be available. So if you do that, then understand that you have to patch every single cumulative update on top of it to come to that uh, 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 point. And um, I'm sorry about this. I don't know how this happened. I, there is a text at the bottom which is colliding with that. There is no perfect size for SharePoint farms as such. So if you're looking for a holy grail that, okay, this is what will give me my SharePoint farm in, in Azure, there is no perfect size. It all depends on usage scenario. Right? SharePoint is such a vast workload where uh, the usage scenarios are different. It's a Swiss Army knife, right? So who uses what function and where and how is what will define uh, uh, your SharePoint. So what, what I suggest is uh, you basically start with a basic uh, image and then you go from there. And just to give you uh, uh, an idea about the costs, uh, now, this is a couple of months old. This might have changed uh, uh, every single month or two. There are new VM sizes that are uh, coming up, and, and, and Microsoft is trying its best to reduce the cost as well. So just just, just be very careful in terms of uh, uh, understanding the cost. You see the same 28 gigabytes in the top four core section and the same 28 gigabytes there. One can cost you 485 and the other will cost you $830. Right? So pick pick the one that is uh, uh, really relevant to you. And again, these cost differences are there for a reason. So if you look at D12 standard and if you look at the D12 V2 promo, both have pretty much the same configuration, but one is significantly cheaper. One is for $335 and the other one is for $485 a month. So, so be careful. And on top of this, Microsoft does give you an option of deploying these without Windows Server licenses which will further reduce the cost of it if you bring your own Windows Server licenses. So if I'm not wrong, uh, you can double check with your um, uh, enterprise agreement or your uh, Azure representative or your uh, partner, uh, Microsoft partner you're working with. Uh, for every single Windows Server license that you have for on-prem, you can run two virtual machines in the cloud. So that is another benefit that you should take care of if you're using this scenario and, and, and you want to run your SharePoint farm in, in, in Azure, all right? And then uh, this is uh, my favorite topic of all in this, storage, right? Um, Microsoft says that uh, you have to uh, use premium storage. Now, what is standard storage and what is premium storage? Uh, this is my question, can anybody in the attendees answer that. I'm going to pause for a minute here. Um, looking at the chat window, can anybody tell me 
the difference between standard storage and, and, and premium storage in Azure? Yes, exactly. That's it. Thank you, Reddy. Uh, Srinath Reddy. Thank you, Srinath. So that's that's what it is. So um, Microsoft says uh, that uh, for the SQL and the SharePoint uh, 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 server that is running your search role, any of the search role, okay, any of the search role, you should be using SSDs. So actually, for others, you can do without SSDs. So again. Be careful when you're designing all the virtual machines and spreading out those different roles. Do that. And uh, you need a minimum of 200 uh, Mbps IOPS for the index roles specifically. So make sure you you, you follow that uh, best practice. And it's not just the IOPS that matter, but there are bandwidth limitations as well that play a role. So even if you have a hard disk that can do 200 Mbps and the VM size has limitations on the IOPS bandwidth in terms of read and write, how much data it can read. So I'm talking about the pipeline between the disk, the storage, and the virtual machine where it's hosted. If that pipeline is limited because of your VM size, then you will not get that performance. So be, be, be careful of how you do this. And then uh, always, always use separate storage accounts per virtual machine, which is recommended, which is usually, uh, so you, you, you can still, Microsoft still says you can have two virtual machines on one storage account, which will work, and, and, and uh, um, use a separate storage for uh, diagnostics data specifically. So every virtual machine has, uh, 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 creates diagnostic data, and you should uh, uh, save that on a separate one so you don't have performance issues. And of course, use the same resource groups for uh, resource groups as virtual machines uh, for storage as well. Don't put them on a different uh, resource group. And this is by far the best way if you want to avoid all of that on the top. And um, uh, by the way, one, one, one very important piece of aspect that I missed about premium and standard storage is, so premium storage is very expensive. Why it is very expensive and why standard storage is uh, cheaper is not because it's SSD only. That's not the only difference why it's expensive. It is expensive because standard storage is, in theory, provisioned in a thin way. Well, if you, if you look at the provisioning on the back end, it's very technical. Uh, they do a thick provisioning in a thin way. It's, 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 it's a different process. So you, you can uh, read about it on the MSD and how it's actually done. If, if you really are interested in that topic, just uh, mm, uh, do a search on that MSDN forum and you'll, you'll, uh, or MSDN uh, search and, and you will find that uh, particular topic. I recommend you to do that uh, just to understand how these uh, storage uh, disks are being provisioned in the back end. But for standard storage, if you provision a 100 GB disk, 128 gig gigabytes of disk, for example, and you use 20 GB, you will be charged for 20 GB, right? But for SSDs, if you are uh, provisioning 128 gigabytes of SSD, you will be charged for 128 no matter how much are you using. So be very careful of your costing analysis as well when you're using SSD storage in, 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 in these. Now managed disks is something I can talk about for a couple of days. It's, it's really um, a, a different beast altogether. And what happens in, in case of managed disk, you get rid of all those limitations as well, right? Uh, not the limitations on the VM size about disk count, but the limitations on the IOPS and the bandwidth stuff is, 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 is gone. So Microsoft says, hey, instead of lending a, from us a storage account, then provisioning a, a VHDX on top of that, why don't we lend you a VHDX directly? And we'll manage what is happening on the backend side for that particular VHDX, right? Make sense? So that is where these managed disks come into play. And uh, my recommendation is if you're starting afresh, if you really understand that concept and it suits your budget, use managed disks because the backup and the restore operations on top of the managed disks is much more easier than accessing that. And not just that, it is an ARM resource, okay? Uh, what do I mean by ARM resource? Remember I talked about role-based access control earlier? So every single uh, uh, Azure resource, right, has a uh, uh, ACL list, access control list, who can access that particular resource. 
So there was a problem in the above scenario where if you by any chance have two virtual machines on one storage account and those two virtual machines belong to two different uh, group of uh, uh, divisions or different administrators who need to manage, they will be able to access the storage account and access the VHDX files for both the, uh, both the virtual machines. So a bit of a security issue in that scenario and you will not be able to differentiate uh, that because in that scenario, the storage is the least uh, uh, privileged uh, uh, resource that you can provide ACL on, right? Uh, so you cannot do that. Yeah. So here you can actually manage who has access to access to that particular disk, the managed disk that you provision in in this scenario, uh, whereby giving you much more control over uh, the security aspect of 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 this uh, virtual uh, hard disk, right? Any questions so far on storage? Do let me know in the chat window, guys. Or if you have any other questions, start go ahead and popping in the chat windows. We are coming close to an end. We have another 15 minutes left, so. We'll do that. Now, there are um, uh, some other uh, best practices as well. So for tempdb, uh, 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 you can use non-persistent SSD drive as well at uh, pretty much the same cost. It is already included. So I don't know how many of you remember. If you provision, if you've ever provisioned a virtual machine in the cloud, it will actually tell you that how much of SSD storage is there, which is a non-persistent SSD. Now, what is non-persistent SSD? Um, every virtual machine has it. So when you have that physical hypervisor, the physical machine where your virtual machine lives, actually, it provides you a D drive from that storage, and it is temporary. So the moment your virtual machine hops from one physical machine to the other one, anything in that storage goes away. And tempdb can be used there. SQL recommends running tempdb on a high IOPS because everything goes through tempdb and that is why Microsoft recommends using that. So make sure you uh, benefit from that uh, uh, non-persistent SSD drive that is given to you in the scenario. Okay. So any SQL uh, environment, whether it's an always on or a cluster uh, that you set up here, uh, use the tempdb on their non-persistent drive D drive. Uh, because even if it goes away when the machine reboots, you, you're perfectly fine with it. Now, you can also extend your content DBs directly to uh, blob storage, but you will need uh, SQL 2014 uh, and uh, above. The benefit of doing this is definitely a better uh, performance. So right now what is happening is storage account, you're having uh, the VHDX on top of the storage account, then you're having... Uh, mm, uh, the connectivity between that storage account to the VM via that storage channel. But in this case, if you do a direct uh, blob storage access to the content DB, you're removing that aspect of that VHDX component here. You're giving them direct access to the blob storage for the database. So uh, uh, there is a, a better performance because you're removing a layer or two from the access management uh, uh, system. So that's why. And of course, uh, you have easy disk management and you have less drives because you directly see the databases on the, in the blob storage itself, right? So uh, if you're not using managed disks, so if you directly want to use your blob storage, your database files can directly uh, uh, survive on blob storage, which is uh, uh, a fabulous way of uh, deploying uh, uh, archive storage specifically, uh, uh, you know, or, or, or content that is less read in uh, less, uh, less write and more read uh, capability, right? And um, we, in, in the SharePoint environment, it only supports LRS. Uh, I don't know, can anybody answer what is LRS, GRS in, in, in the IAS world? In, in specifically in, well, it, it pretty much, I think is covered in AWS as well, right? So, uh, I see she not typing there. Perfect. Yes, absolutely, she not. Thank you. So LRS is locally redundant storage, and GRS is globally redundant storage. So um, for the content databases, for uh, those storage types, we only recommend LRS. And even for the storage that you're going to use for SharePoint virtual machines, you have to use LRS. Uh, GRS is not supported. Obviously, the reason is the geo redundant uh, uh, stuff is very difficult. But yes, you can use GRS for your uh, SharePoint log shipping or that where, where, where you want to do a DR. That's the different scenario. Remember that this is for your 
uh, uh, production live running load. Okay. All right. Now, how do you go ahead and deploy this? Right. I, I told you. Uh, we'll. I'll, I'll give you a very basic. Uh, uh, so 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 uh, a basic quick way to get started in uh, Azure. You don't have to start from scratch here. Hell no. Okay. Uh, to get started, you can of of course you can completely automate this via uh, PowerShell. You can use ARM. Um, if you understand Azure Service Model, which was the classic model, you can do that, but uh, don't do that anymore. Microsoft has deprecated that. Then there is another very beautiful way of doing uh, deployments of uh, SharePoint, whether on-prem or in Azure, which is uh, DSC. Uh, DSC is basically using PowerShell only. It's the desired state configuration option. And then uh, there are other uh, third-party orchestration engines like uh, Jenkins and other clouds that are available, uh, like uh, Chef and Puppet, uh, that can be used in conjunction to other things to deploy these farms and, and take them off uh, when not required, right? And to get started, you can use this uh, high availability farm uh, in Azure Deployment Kit that is available from Microsoft itself, right? And we're going to look at uh, one of the quick start templates now, all right? So let me quickly open one file and we'll go from there. issues opening that link. Give me one second, guys. All right. It's opening up. So this is this is the kit I was talking about. Hope everybody can see it. Right? And one of the benefits of this kit is uh, there is an Excel file in configuration that is available to you. Let's go ahead and open this one very specifically. I have it downloaded. And we're going to quickly go through this and show you exactly what it is so you can very easily uh, go ahead and deploy this in your environment as well. right? And there is a very good bonus in the end. I'm going to show you what it is in this file. Uh, now, I hope everybody can see it and read what I have. So this is the very basic uh, structure and architecture of uh, uh, SharePoint Farm in Azure. You have identity management done via domain controllers. Both of them are, uh, there, there are two of them because of high availability. Then you have the SQL environment. Uh, you can either have them in an active passive cluster or an always on in, uh, configuration. You have two app service, uh, servers and you have two web front end servers. And then you have a gateway and you have a site to site VPN. So this is not publicly accessible. This will only be accessible via uh, uh, your uh, on premise network. And we are using uh, a VPN or Express Route. You can do that, right? And uh, you have your resource group. So what you can do is you can put your Azure subscription name, location where you want your uh, short location name. You can define all your storage accounts here. You can define your virtual networks that you want, your IP address spacing and everything. And in the second tab, your subnets, then your static IP addresses for the servers. Your DNS servers, you can define them if you're not using uh, the DNS service of your domain controller. Your uh, local net uh, address spacing, then your availability sets, of course. So in this case, there'll be four availability sets for four different sets of high availability. Then you can define your virtual machine. So this is this is interesting, right? Why is this tab specifically interesting? Is because it gives you a basic standard standing uh, block of which virtual machine type and size to use for what purpose. So it is telling you for domain controllers you can start with this, for um, SQL servers you can start with this, uh, for your application servers you can do this, and for your uh, web uh, front end servers you can use uh, the D4. Right. So this is if, if, if you really don't have anything to start with, you don't have your usage pattern, you just have a very vague understanding of your uh, load requirement, uh, 
uh, uh, you can take this as a starting point of architecture and, and go from there and make amendments to it as you uh, go forward, right? And the best part, if you fill this data, your automated PowerShell is ready for you. You just fill that data over there and every single item will be there. You just run these PowerShell commands using uh, the Azure PowerShell uh, module and you can go ahead and have your complete farm configured right then and there with all the servers, which is really, uh, I find much value in reducing your time in terms of deployment and even getting your basic skeleton architecture in place, right? So uh, we are pretty much ending our uh, time here and uh, Let's, I'll go back to the, uh, and, and, and apart from this, there are a lot of GitHub, uh, uh, there are a lot of GitHub uh, quick start templates available as well in the link mentioned below, right? Right, I'm gonna go back and check my chat window, right there. How long does it take? Uh, Deepthi, I haven't done this on my own because uh, those, uh, 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 Thrimal, uh, uh, Thrimal ready, uh, there is an attachment available, this whole presentation you can download it uh, or uh, Deepthi will share this uh, presentation with you after this uh, session. So uh, uh, you can just look at the attachment options uh, within this uh, live meeting and you can download it. Perfect, thanks. Uh, so uh, there is just one more slide left that we need to talk about which is the supportability. So. Um, um, your non-production farms, such as those used for your dev and test environments or proof of concepts are definitely uh, supported. Production farms are supported, but you have to use premium storage for the servers running the search role, okay? And production farms running SharePoint 2013 are also supported. 2010 is no longer in mainstream support anyways, but you can install it and, and still uh, have uh, Microsoft uh, support, but you have to talk to the uh, your your uh, uh, account manager from uh, Azure, sorry, from Microsoft to, to, to make sure they'll include it in their support contract. And for disaster recovery, uh, log shipping, SQL servers, and these, these all scenarios are also uh, supported. One big question that I have is about Office Web Apps. <laughs> so, uh, uh, one of the biggest reasons where my clients are like, uh, well, uh, we all use, if we are using SharePoint 2013 or 2016 on-prem, they definitely use Office Web Apps. And Office Web Apps, the way it is licensed, is not allowed to run in, it's clearly mentioned in the licensing that it's not allowed to run in uh, cloud. So you cannot technically run it in the cloud. How true is that? I don't know. Again. Uh, I think the bottom line is uh, you should talk to your enterprise agreement uh, partner, uh, whoever uh, your license manager is from Microsoft, and uh, get specific approval that you want to do this and, and, and run this in the cloud. I, I doubt Microsoft is going to say no to their business running in cloud, even though this is not allowed, but uh, take specific approval by talking to your license manager and make sure it's, it's, it's done. Otherwise, uh, I mean, uh, majority of my clients, they don't, they don't see their, uh, uh, they don't see their uh, environment complete without Office Web App Server, right? And uh, this is uh, just an additional slide right here that uh, I copied from there, and uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you. And coming back to Deepti's question, Deepti, I haven't done that because my Azure subscription doesn't allow running those many amount of virtual machines in certain amount of time. So yes, I myself haven't tried it yet, but it, 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 it shouldn't take uh, much, much long. And um, I would definitely pose that question to uh, the MSDN uh, gallery uh, guy who actually wrote this uh, PowerShell script and he would probably be able to give you some timelines how long it takes, All right? Um, waiting for questions. And Deepthi, I already asked a couple of questions in the middle and Srinath was uh, uh, the person who answered it the most, so uh, you should probably pick him for our raffle prize, whatever it is. Yes, definitely, definitely. So, uh, 
there are no more questions that that's it from my end thank you deepthi so much thank for arranging this thank you jasjit thank you jasjit for your time and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar uh, if you have any the questions regarding webinar you can contact me or if you have any questions regarding this session you can directly contact uh, to jasjit so on behalf of uh, aos community and our presenters thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day thank you so much